morning, good afternoon and good evening and thanks for stopping by. Our dedicated team will guide you through with the latest updates and theories at Starbase Texas. the channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon for future streams. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening everyone. Starbase friends around the world, Astro Joe here for RGB Aerial Photography. Welcome to episode 109. Sorry, we've been uh, a little sporadic. The weather has been less than delightful to uh, fly in uh, or be safe in. But uh, let's get right into the show. I'll uh, send it on over to your host, Stephanie. G'day from Australia. I'm Stephanie B. And welcome to another live stream. Got a couple of awesome guests commentators today. And I'll start by introducing uh, Ryan Hansen from Ryan Hansen Space. G'day. Glad to be back, everyone. Uh, we should have an exciting flyover. There's a lot of cool images to see and some uh, post-launch review. So uh, I guess buckle right in and we'll dig into a lot of images here today. And our other guest today is BJ. G'day, BJ. Welcome, everyone, to this week's show. Uh, exciting launch last week. And uh, yeah, like Ryan said, lots of good stuff to see, uh, to digest from uh, the aftermath and other things looking towards uh, future flights. Okay, we'll start with a quick look at the OLM because everyone wants to know what the OLM looks like. And as far as we can tell, it's fared fairly well. There's a bit of charring again on one side. And um, we might, with that, we might go into some flight review. Uh, Ryan, how do you feel about that? Sure. So, uh, if you haven't heard, um, Starship launched again. And uh, this will be the, the third flight of Starship. So SpaceX was trying to expand on uh, the advancements that they made and success from flight two. So um, lifted off on the first attempt, which seems to be um, becoming a norm actually with Starship at this point. Um, but uh, all 33 lit up uh, for the second time. So good, uh, good progress there. And uh, this flight actually went more straight up than uh, the previous flights uh, before pitching over. So it seems that the, the tower avoidance maneuver might be um, slightly minimized um, going forward. So um, it's good for, uh, I guess, keeping the infrastructure in good working condition. But big change for this flight is that we got a enormous amount of onboard views. So absolutely spoiled with these onboard views. And uh, I love the way that the cloud layers here really give a sense of speed um, as the, the stack ascends and uh, it punches through. I think there's three different layers of clouds, so it was really cool to, to see all these views here. Um, but yeah, 33 engines continued to burn. Um, they actually made the, the full duration burn with all 33 engines for the second time, so um, it seems that the, the Super Heavy is much more reliable um, at this point compared to, to Flight 1. And we can see from the onboard views here from the ship that uh, the tiles are actually holding up surprisingly well compared to ship 25. Um, and this flight seems like it might have a little bit more power as well. Um, so they're really putting a lot of stress on these tiles. And it actually looked like a majority of the tiles that fell off came from the flaps um, and some of the, uh, the, the curved aero surfaces. So. Uh, the attachment to the body of the ship itself is actually uh, much more robust. So all the changes they made for 28 definitely helped out quite a bit. Um, and I just love this shot here. You can see the plume expanding, expanding, and uh, you can see the, the trail there from the launch site. So really, really cool shots that we got from on board. Um, we've never gotten uh, a shot you know, like this before from the, the flap cam. I think the previous flights we only ever saw um, I think was on the launch pad itself. So really cool to, to see those cams um, in action during flight. So I think it's safe to say that Starlink worked out uh, really well this time. And as we get closer to hot staging here, you can see that the fins actually turn like we suspected. 
And um, hot staging was a little bit different this time. The booster actually went in a slightly different direction. So a um, little bit of a possible mitigation from issues they, they previously had. So, um, but yeah, ship 28 ignited all six engines and um, booster 10 actually got all 13 engines for the, the boost back burn. So, um, and actually continued, they all stay, um, they also were able to stay lit. And uh, so that was pretty, pretty cool. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually the ship. I know some people have said that's the ship. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I, I feel like from this angle, you might be able to, to see a little bit different, but it could be the ship. I just don't see the engines um, burning like I thought I would. So, but maybe it is a ship. And yep, boost back continuing here. Um, Super Heavy is coming back. Still has all 13 lit, which is a really, really good sign that uh, some of the mitigations from the last launch uh, worked out very, very well. And uh, there is a little bit of a... Uh, the shutdown sequence for the boost back is a little interesting. It's not symmetric, um, but we believe that what they're doing here is actually inducing a little bit of a pitch maneuver on the booster to um, slowly get the engine section to actually point back towards the launch site because as it's coming back down to land, you obviously need to flip those engines at least 90 degrees so that you're kind of you know pencil diving because um, your engines were pointed in the direction that the ship was flying before for the boost back. So it appears that this is a little bit of a, of that kind of maneuver because you can see after they do that shutdown, it kind of slowly starts to, to rotate a little bit. So, um, but this is the first time Super Heavy has made it through the, the boost back. So um, really, really good progress there. And uh, Ship 28 is continuing on um, and uh, burning through a lot of its propellant. And yeah, these views from Super Heavy were just absolutely amazing as it uh, slowly turns and the clouds get closer and closer. And we can see the grid fins there. Uh, first time the grid fins have actually started to uh, to rotate in flight um, during a descent of the Super Heavy booster. So um, this is where things go a little bit awry for the booster. But um, overall, I think getting to this point was a massive amount of data for them. Still not sure what went wrong here. Um, a lot of speculation. Um, I'm sure SpaceX probably has a pretty good idea of what happened, but uh, get down to one kilometer, engines start, um, or at least they try to, and uh, only ended up getting, I think, one stayed lit for some amount of time. Um, you can see some green in the flames, indicating probably engine rich. Um, so not a good time for the booster, but uh, it did crash into the ocean, um, mostly intact, and uh, pretty fast, about uh, 1,000 kilometers per hour, or I think 690 miles per hour, so pretty pretty big uh, impact there. And uh, so the booster did its job, a lot of data from that, and uh, the ship continued on here, and it made it through the, the full burn, um, so this would be the first starship to actually make it through its entire burn and uh, pretty big success there. Um, after the burn completed, there was quite a bit of venting from uh, the, the skirt of the ship. It's unclear if that was um, a replacement for the, uh, the excess liquid oxygen dump um, or if that was not expected, not entirely sure. There was some uh, rotation that was observed. Again, it's unclear if that rotation was planned um, to be you know, part of a, a specific test um, or if uh, there was actually an issue with the vehicle at this point in time. But um, SpaceX did proceed um, and they did a couple of the, uh, the milestone um, tests for this flight, which included a propellant transfer for NASA's tipping point um, contract. And they also actuated the payload bay door, which we don't think exactly went to plan. Uh, there was a little bit of jerky motion, and it doesn't look like it quite opened um, as far as it should have. Um, could be the angle of the camera, but uh, not entirely sure if that went off without a hitch. Um, but uh, it's, it's nice to be able to have a door actuated in space, considering the previous two vehicles um, they were quite, uh, they were welded shut. There, there was no way a door was opening on those vehicles. So um, first test of the door in space, I'd say they probably learned quite a bit from that. 
Um, and then they ended up skipping the Raptor Relight demo because of the uh, rotation that the ship was experiencing. Um, I believe at this point it was deemed that uh, they didn't really have control over the ship. Um, my theory is I think some vents might have gotten frozen open. Um, they may not have had the uh, RCS control that, that they wanted. Um, it's possible that they ended up venting more than they wanted because of the any, any vents that were frozen open. So it's unclear if the computer determined. I, I would imagine the flight computer um, determined that they were not going to do uh, the relight um, automatically. So um, a lot of cool views from, from Starship in space. Uh, I suppose the... <laughs> The benefit of the, the rotation is it gave us a lot of really cool views, but uh, I don't think this is you know what they wanted um, at this point in time. They, I feel like it should have been a lot more stable, um, but uh, incredible views from Starship 28 as it kind of rotated over uh, the Earth. And we got to see our first flap motion um, in space, which was really cool. Um, I believe this was around the time that the computer predicted that it would start re-entering, so it was trying to control its attitude with the, the flaps, um, thinking any minimal amount of atmosphere uh, might have an effect, um, but it kind of continued rotating. We do end up seeing some um, debris coming off the vehicle. I believe a lot of that is going to be ice, um, but there are some larger chunks at one point that do appear to be um, some parts of tiles. Um, but then, yeah, we get here toward the exciting portion um, where the heat started to build up on one of the flaps. And uh, we realized kind of in real time what we were seeing, which was the first uh, re-entry of a Starship vehicle. So really, really cool to see that plasma uh, start to build up on the flaps. And um, very, very cool, uh, the fact that Starlink was able to provide views um, of this live <laughs> from space from the largest uh, spacecraft, you know, re-entering uh, the atmosphere. So I'm sure there's going to be tons and tons of cool, cool views like this going forward. Um, at this point in time, though, we realized that re-entry was not going to go well. Um, the ship is actually coming in sideways at this point, so half of the metal side is exposed to the plasma, you can see on the left, and then the tiles over here to the right. So um, not the ideal uh, orientation to be uh, entering the atmosphere. And it does actually tumble so that the engine section is down. So uh, right here is where the, the Raptor engines are basically taking the, uh, the brunt of the reentry plasma. So again, not the ideal orientation, but um, the fact that we got these views for as long as we did from the ship is pretty impressive. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, we did lose connection to the ship, um, both of the uh, NASA tracking and data um, satellites, we lost connection from those, as well as Starlink around the same time, um, probably due to the plasma melting the antennas. Um, and so the ship probably survived for a little bit longer uh, before breaking up. Um, so at some point the ship broke up later, but we got some incredible views from this reentry in, in real time. The fact that this was live streamed is just an impressive feat in itself. Um, so a lot of cool science is probably going to come out of observing uh, Starship re-entering the atmosphere, um, especially if we continue to have live views like this. So it'll be very cool on future missions when uh, they, they're able to get the attitude um, issue figured out with the ship during re-entry, and uh, we get kind of a uninterrupted view, hopefully, of the ship making it through the atmosphere. It'll be quite the incredible sight to, to see that. I know there's those Falcon 9 videos that kind of show from launch to, to landing all in one shot, and uh, getting a, a view of that from, from Starship will be um, pretty next level, in my opinion. So, But yeah, I believe this is getting close to where we lose cams. Yep, I believe this is the last uh, couple frames we got from the ship, and some data does come through, but it's unclear if um, that was still tracking data or if that was a um, kind of a, a live um, interpolation of, of data. So, um, but yep, at some point we lose connection. 
Um, SpaceX did wait around a little bit, thinking that there might have been a blockout period due to the orientation of the vehicle, um, but uh, it did not come back. So um, Ship 28 uh, likely broke up at some point. So. This was a really cool uh, little animation that was put together. Kind of shows the the angle. And it's a little confusing with the flaps moving and the earth moving and the vehicle moving, kind of what's going on. So this is a visualization that was put together to, to show all of that kind of going on in real time from different perspectives. And it uh, gives a, a different perspective that's a little easier to understand. So you can see the, uh, the ship rolling there. So. Definitely props to uh, putting this together because this is uh, this is pretty cool. It gives a good a good um, idea of what actually happened to the ship. So I see through chats and in uh, comments that perhaps the ship doesn't have enough control authority with the flaps going by the reentry. But um, the ship should have been sitting like the space shuttle. It should have been stable before reentry. Yeah, if you look on the left screen here, this is approximately the position it should have been in. The problem is that it already had so much roll. Uh, there was inertia within the, the vehicle, and the atmosphere is so thin at this point, the flops can't actually do much. Um, so it continued to roll over, and this is where they pretty much lose all control during uh, reentry. It starts going in sideways, and then it flips engine section down. So... Um, I believe that there was some sort of an RCS issue, um, whether it was an issue with their modeling or event froze or hardware failure, whatever it may be. Um, I think they probably have a pretty good idea by now um, of what happened. Um, and uh, again, you know, this is this is where it kind of goes awry. But uh, yeah, had they kept it or been able to keep it in that orientation, um, it would have probably made it pretty far through uh, reentry. We probably would have gotten longer views. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think the flaps aren't designed, I guess, really to work at this altitude. It's mainly um, the vehicle should be already stable and it wasn't. So that was the problem. So in, in this view, we can see a bit of what the launch table actually experiences under. Thanks, Ryan. That was a really good review, by the way. And here we can see the launch table getting quite a bit of Heat. And if you haven't already uh, seen it, Everyday Astronaut dropped his uh, compilation of footage with um, Cosmic Perspective today. And there's a lot of other cool views that, that show the, the, the liftoff. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend going in and checking that out. But yeah, you can, you can see the, the heating on the, the launch mounts uh, quite a bit from, from SpaceX and as well as uh, Cosmic Perspective's footage. Oops. All right, let's go back to the actual site. Okay, so once again, the launch site looks fairly good. At least there's no hole underneath. We can see the dance floor underneath, but otherwise we can't see any real damage. The Pondag seemed to handle it quite well. A little bit of cracking perhaps over here. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of that cracking from all the pre from the previous flights, uh, from flight two as well. So it could just be just a natural uh, damage that we're going to continue to see. I mean, but yeah, the 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 charring around there is definitely uh, pretty uniform. And other than like, kind of getting a little bit closer to the QD or the QD than what we might want it to be, <laughs> judging by the half of the ring that seems like it's not even touched by the flames at all. Yeah, a couple of doors down here. Um, one of our um, valued members, Thomas, found those doors out in the flats. Just yeah, something that. else that was in that last photo that was really prominent uh, that we've seen a little. I think some of it's preventative. Some of it was from the launch, but the uh, uh, they had added uh, some catwalks to the chopstick arms. Um, for crew access, and you can kind of see in this one there, we've got one piece of grating that's still attached there. Uh, we see an evidence in ground photos that uh, three or four pieces landed on the QD arm and some also made it all the way to the ground. I suspect that most of what we see missing there is them preventatively removing a bunch since we had a couple of days since the launch. 
that they probably went through and made sure that none were going to fall on workers after flight. So I think a lot of them, the, they might have not welded them hard enough and removed ones that might have been questionable. Yeah, we've seen the the sound waves kind of, you know, propagate through the launch site, and it's probably not unreasonable to assume that, you know, sound waves bouncing off of the ground could have lifted those um, up out of their little trays that they're sitting in and uh, <laughs> thrown them about. Yeah, and folded them in half like a book, too. It was pretty crazy. I can see a little bit of uh, flame ingress into the hole. So they've opened the clamps already, which is a good sign. And they've got those little chains set up to hold the clamps, I guess, to do some work inside. You can see a bit of charring on the actual clamp arm. So a bit of plume ended up going into the little holes where the clamps go into. We can see the QDs all there. So we know at least they were able to open the clamp straight away, which is a good sign. Overall, it seems like the the paint on the, the booster QD held up uh, a lot better this launch. I think that probably has something to do with the more upward trajectory that they, they took this time. Um, there is a little bit of uh, charring here and there, but uh, it looks like the the change to the maneuver um, did minimize uh, a little bit of damage. Um, so the fact that they were able to kind of operate the, the booster QD after launch um, pretty much indicates at least the hydraulics in there are likely okay. So there might be some minor, you know, upkeep to do. Um, but uh, it looks like the site is it's pretty good, um, at least, you know, OML or OLM wise. Uh, it looks like it's it's pretty good. Um, apologies, Jake. Was there any questions on the actual launch uh, review, please? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I'd first like to uh, thank Kalistia Lee for becoming a member and that. Methane Man for gifting 20 memberships and John Depker for $10 starting the train, as well as Seabreeze. Thanks for your $100 donation. That is amazing. It says thanks wow. to all. RGV for your dedication and efforts to get the get us this quality programming. Steve Coates, buck ninety nine, couple of bucks for St. Pat's. Denny seventy one, ten euros, great work, happy to support you guys. Rocket profit, twenty dollar super chat, a few greenbacks in the pot on this great St. Patrick's Day. Huffy asking, do you think they will make the deluge system of future launch pads spread further out? Uh, that's a good question. Well, going on the launches we've had so far, the Deluge system seems to be doing its job. So maybe, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I don't I think they would. Um, I think the design they have works pretty, pretty good because what they're doing is they're essentially spraying water where the plume from each engine would impinge on the ground. And they're trying to cool that interaction as quickly as possible and turn it to steam as well as shoot it out from underneath the mount between the legs to get that out of there um and i think they they're doing a pretty good job of that i would i would assume that the design is kind of built with you know potential uh, raptor upgrades in mind um you know maybe they need to upgrade the or introduce more pressure to the water uh, i'm sure that can be done pretty easily um, so I don't necessarily think that uh, there's an issue with the, the water system um, necessarily. I, I think this design works pretty well. Great. Question from Iggy Burke. Uh, do, are there enough internal fuel baffles to stop the fuel from continuing to whirl when the ship's controls are working to overcome a spin? So that is that's inferring that there was an issue with the ship spinning was to do with the baffles or what's going on inside the vehicle, but it seems like an RCS issue while it was actually in uh, space, uh, I think. Yeah, I, I see what that question is asking. That is also something that I had thought about um, was maybe after they took the propellant from the header tanks and put it back in the main tanks, if the rotation of the ship was causing that to slosh around um, and increase, you know, the amplitude of the um, the attitude adjustments, I guess you could say. And it's definitely possible that that could have played a role. Um, but regardless, they should be able to have control of the ship to stop it from, from rotating. 
Um, so I, I think there there definitely was an RCS issue, uh, whether it was via a hardware failure or some sort of control modeling um, that pr probably um, was a cause of the, the issue that we observed. I've got a little question on that note. Was the role, do you think that's what Elon mentioned, was meaning when he mentioned about the ship uh, spinning? Um, I'm not really sure. I Part of me, after going back and looking at the footage, um, it's hard to tell if part of the role initially had something to do with the, the fill transfer test. We don't know. Um, I don't think SpaceX will tell us necessarily, um, since that might be a little bit of a trade secret. But it seems like there may have been some attempt to have a specific amount of role, but then they couldn't recover from that role, um, possibly due to a frozen event after the coasting period of some time. Um, so it's unclear how much of that was necessarily um, intentional, and if it, you know, if none of it was. Thank you. Question from Space Flight X: Do we know where the next OLM will have? Do we know? Do we think? Sorry, uh, my chat bot is scrolling on me here. Uh, do we know where the area is for OLPB will be built on? I will say OLIT two B. I mean, we think over in this area. Well, it was in the paperwork that. Tower 2 is going to be constructed in the suborbital tank farm area. That was in some of the paperwork that was put in with this little land um, acquisition here. Yes, I believe that they'll do basically the same thing they did for the first uh, launch tower um, in Mount, which was put them basically directly at the property line or as close as they possibly can. I shouldn't say property line, but the area where they can build, because at one point when they started building the tower, they were you know, right up against um, the limit that they could build on. So I have a feeling that they'll probably put the tower down in the lower left here um, on the strip of land that they have not gotten access to build on. So tower and OLM will probably be somewhere down here. Um, and then all of the area that they're currently um, using the, uh, I believe it's the dewatering system right now, um, will likely be for tank farm and, and water farm. Thank you. Next question from Huffy. Do you think the next OLM will have the, as it scrolls on me again, will have the water jacket, as Elon has once mentioned, to reduce maintenance? It's possible. Um, we kind of foreshadowing, there are more preps going on for adding additional burn plates to the top of the, the launch mount. Um, so I think SpaceX has a, an idea of um, potentially what might be needed to protect that that upper uh, deck at this point. Um, so it's possible that the next launch mount has something to spray water up there. Um, I don't know if it would necessarily be like the, the water-cooled plate uh, down underneath the engines, um, but something that's spraying water is, is definitely a, a possibility that we might see. All right, for a question from Crane Man. Are there any pictures of the flap cam with the ship on pad or transport? Um, I guess uh, looking for the a shot of the camera that was on the flap, I guess. I can't recall myself, Ryan. Yeah, um, I mean, I've I know seen, there's been I've photos seen... in the past. Yeah, I know Ring Watchers have had them in some of their com some of their comparative analyses uh, over vehicle changes. Um, so but I don't recall where we'd quickly grab one from. It's in the very end of the flap. So it's not like midway. It's, it's basically um, the rounded part at the end of the flap. Uh, it's basically dead center in the middle of that. So it's pretty much as far away from the, the vehicle as you can possibly get. All right. I want to thank Jax for gifting a membership as well as John Depker for gifting five. Thank you both. And a question, a super chat from James L, $5 super chat. Great launch. Do you think Booster 11 and Ship 29 will launch in April or May? I think April is probably too soon. <laughs> um, I, because this launch, um, 
I haven't heard, I guess, exact confirmation. I think the FAA might have kind of insinuated some confirmation, but it sounds like the booster and the ship both are requiring a mishap report. Um, even though the booster splashed down, I, I don't think that um, it or it met the specification to not have a mishap. So there, there are going, going to be mishap reports for both of those vehicles. Um, and I think that there's probably some minimum amount of time associated with that report. Even if SpaceX you know, knows exactly what went wrong right now and they submit their report, there's going to be some minimum amount of time. So I think two months is probably the minimum that it would probably require for that. I think the vehicles could potentially be ready in about a month and a half maybe two months so hopefully those both come due at around the same time and the flight every two months well that gives you six flights over the next 12 months which is about their target as far as i know okay. all right 599 euro super chat can the booster i'm um, sorry from anthony monahan can the booster Q, uh, qdc be moved to the uncharred part of the launch mount on future OLM designs. You'd think that'd be a good idea, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, my personal opinion is that, I mean, physically it probably can, but I, I would think that there would be some drawbacks uh, to having a, the QDs on opposite sides between the ship and the booster. And I would think that they, even if this uh, the booster quick disconnect's going to get blasted on every flight. They just have to work around that would be my suspicion. What difficulties do you foresee having the quick disconnects on opposite sides of the vehicles? Just out of curiosity. I don't know. I just, I guess in just the, the fact that they, I mean, if it launches straight up, yeah, I guess it probably doesn't matter. I just intuitively, I feel like the same side makes most logical sense. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Any more? My cue is clear. Good stuff. All right. So, oh, I don't know if I get this photo. There was a little bit of damage to one of the water tanks, but that was from previous flights. I'll just find my photo here. Yeah, I initially saw I initially saw that and was thinking that was there and it had to do a little bit of read looking back prior to launch to see that they just did that was one spot that uh, when they were pulling all the dents out they didn't quite get that last dent all the way out as well as they did some of the other ones. And the only other major damage which is pretty minor was this cable tray just here. Possibly got hit by acoustics, possibly got hit by an object just on that point right there. So all in all, the launch site fared very well this, this launch once again, which is a positive sign for fast turnaround. I guess the only really unknown is how much work they're going to need to put into the OLM again to get it ready. But um, having the clamps out already is a good sign as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I feel like some of the work we saw happen on like the clamps and, and things like that, it, it almost didn't feel like the flyover photos and stuff from flight two even suggested that there was really any problems there. So I feel like the lack of anything obvious is questionable and we'll have to just see and hope that all the things that they did between flights two and three um, have proven to not require tons of refurbishment. And uh, yeah. Q, Q, they were slightly bent down on one side once again, but only slightly this time. Yeah, we don't believe that there's anything broken on the ship QD this time. It, my personal opinion is that it could be something related to the pistons that um, kind of push it up because there's two pistons that basically make a triangle um, that you can kind of, adjusting one or the other, you can kind of lean the, the QD one side or another, and that, that gives them a little bit more flexibility on kind of uh, mating up to the ship. And it's possible that one of those pistons might be more compressed than the other, um, you know, maybe a damage to some hydraulic lines or, or something. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily broken like it was after uh, the last launch. Thank you. Got a couple of late breaking questions here. Tibinin and uh, hey, uh, Pezdor pressure release was the start of the spin. Uh, that is the question. Um, the spin incurred was earlier than that. The 
ship was spinning when the Pez door was opening, I think, wasn't it? The yeah, it's um the ship started to a little bit of a roll as basically right after Seiko. Um now if that roll got worse after the door opened, I guess I haven't really looked uh in detail about that. Um I don't think that they're actually pressurizing the payload section enough um to have it, you know, be like a you know, like the door blowing off of an aircraft per se. Um but uh, I suppose it's possible that that could have um, at least uh, contributed to the, you know, large amount of rotation at some point. Question from Seabreeze. Would stainless mitigate the charring on the OLM better than carbon steel? Also, would it increase longevity? So a lot of the metal that they've added on to the launch mount is actually stainless. Um, there, there's a lot more stainless on there um, than there was originally. There's still some exposed, um, I guess, carbon steel, which you can tell it, it's typically the stuff that's a little bit more of a pink color. Um, so yeah, anything that's like yellow in here is more of a stainless and the pink is actually that carbon. Um, so yeah, those are the original awnings that were on the outside. Uh, that kind of covered the the electric panels and everything that they had that were visible for you know a couple years. Um, those are not stainless, and they do take quite a bit of beating. Um, but the other stuff is actually stainless. So the deck is stainless there, and then the outer walkway covers are stainless now. So um, the use of stainless is definitely better, um, but uh, there's quite a bit they would have to actually replace or cover up in order to make all of the surfaces uh, stainless. And Stainless is not cheap, so they probably wanted to prove that this design would work before spending uh, the massive amounts of money that would be required to construct a relatively fully stainless steel uh, launch mount. Right. Crane Man asked, did the plywood fly off of that new triangle building? <laughs> Yeah, we saw there's plywood in the, the frames. The, they had installed some of the glass, um, and then they had just placed plywood in the frames that did not have glass yet. So it did seem like maybe a little bit of the pressure waves made it into some of the openings on the other walls and maybe kind of worked their way through and pushed them out or just whatever forces removed those uh, like eight or so panels that it were filled with plywood. The building um, fared quite well, though. It's still there. Doesn't look cracked or anything. I'll admit, I'm pretty surprised that they decided to put glass or, well, they might be like a Lexan that could take the, the pressure waves, but I'm surprised they decided to put windows on a building like this that close to the rocket. But um, I, I suppose if, if they can make it work, they'll, they'll try. Chip Cavett asks, would the fuel dump would have caused the roll? That's kind of my uh, suspicion, and I, I believe because they said that they eliminated well the the fuel dump as part of the um, the burn, and we know that they actually filled the ship with less fuel. I think the last flight they filled it to around ninety six percent based on their little graphic, and this time around it looked like they were hovering around eighty five percent on the ship. So they definitely gave it uh, less propellant. Um, and I do think that it's possible that some of that venting right after Seco was um, the the LOX dump. Uh, they just delayed it until after Seco. And it's possible, you can see with the vents kind of opening and closing, that they might be trying to do some sort of attitude control during that dump um, because it does kind of look like valves are opening and closing. So it's possible that that um, was what contributed to some of the, the roll. Uh, Heinrichs, question, what happened to the SQD arm swinging away from the stack during launch? Any idea? Well, it did. Um, it just slows pretty, or it, uh, it swings pretty slowly. So it, uh, it definitely um, does not swing as fast as it should, given um, how quickly the, the stack takes off, especially now that they've given it a little bit more thrust at liftoff. Uh, but it still swings away for sure. 
Bruce Stoff with a 499 Super Chat. What's the ship RCS going to look like on Flight 4? Speculate, please. Well, it's a little late to be making significant hardware changes to the ship. So um, if it's a matter of um, one of the vents being you know, frozen open or shut, um, they may be able to add some you know, heater tape like you might put in your, your gutter if you live in like a, a colder climate that has snow and ice. They might be able to put some heater tape you know, on the vent itself to, to heat it up. Um, th there's changes like that that they might make that are a little bit more um, you know, able to be done. If there's more of a significant hardware change um, required, then SpaceX might take a little bit of a different route um, and implement that on a on a later vehicle, but but change maybe a, a flight plan um, for for Ship Twenty Nine. So I don't necessarily think we're going to see any differences. Other well, I don't think we're outwardly going to, going to see any differences. It'll be probably changes you know internally or via software that that they'll change. Great. I got a 10, ten euro super chat um, that we all know won't happen, but I'm going to read it anyway from Endless. My thoughts are that they will build only build a bear tower with chopsticks, and they're they wow bad grammar. I'm sorry. They will practice catching everything because no need another launch table to learn catching stuff. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I think Zach's really gone over a lot of that in terms of the ground support that's going to be needed to repressurize and drain any excess fluids after a booster lands. Um, and I, I feel like the the first launch attempt, catch attempt anyways, is probably going to be very, very successful because I think they're going to do enough simulated landings in the ocean to be really, really confident in their targeting and, and all that. So I don't think they'll ever be a, a catch-only tower. They need to have more launch sites in order to uh, fulfill Artemis requirements. So at this point, I think that they're going to be pretty full steam ahead on outfitting as many launch sites as they can. We've seen work at 39A recently, so uh, it seems like they are going to be trying to get at least three launch sites um, up and going probably within the next year or two. And uh, hopefully they can, they can get there, but I don't think we'll see a, a tower that is a catch only at least. Definitely. The Procky asking, uh, have they started building Ship 33 yet? It seems like they are waiting for more flight data before start uh, before starting the first version 2. I don't know about the status of those ships, but I will say I think V2 isn't necessarily like a change in the ship design like version 3 is. I think version 2 is more so a ship that is optimized for construction within the factory. So we probably won't see a lot of version 2 ships um, or parts coming out of the factory until they can get that assembly line up and going. All right, I'm done with questions for the, for the time being. Thank you. Awesome questions there from chat. Well done. A little you see that bit. wall? That wall didn't uh, quite shield everything, this launch. Um, that is a, a new wall for uh, Flight 3, and uh, it did a little bit of damage over here. This this area takes quite a bit of damage pretty much each launch, but uh, new water tank, I believe it blew some of the um, protective covering off of it. I think uh, some hippos took some damage too. Yep, those new liquid oxygen hippos took a little bit of damage to their covering. That's yeah, there. it seems yeah, it oh. seems like from watching the that the water tank down there at the bottom be built, it seems like the company that's been doing a lot of this insulation uh, cladding, the the installation technique it doesn't seem very solid. I mean, in that water tank, it's like most of those panels didn't even seem to be attached to each other. It was like there maybe a light crimping, and then they had some banding around it to hold it in. But it's like if, I feel like it needs a little bit more structural integrity between all the seams of the sheet metal that they put in there. And we saw the evidence of the lack of securement. Serial, um, photos show these water tank, new water tanks being installed, or I should say horizontal tanks, speculated to be water tanks for the D, for the, um, for the... That nation suppression. Yeah, sorry for that. Yeah. And perhaps for these little fire hydrants here as well. 
Um, so on our time, um, are we happy to move on from the launch site now and go on to Macy's and have a look over in that area? Okay, we'll do that. Then. So it was awesome to see that launch and um, all the footage that came out of it. I'm pretty impressed myself. We'll start over here at the Flame Trench area and there's rapid development going on over here. This Flame Trench is going to be operational fairly quickly, I think, a lot quicker than some people might think. Yeah, it seems like they're at the top. They had just finished uh, pouring the, the last of the perimeter wall um, for the for the uh, trench and uh, with the excavators getting in place, it looks like we're getting close to uh, some excavation time to start uh, getting down to the, what the bottom of that uh, area is going to look like. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a little misleading here, but there's a... Uh, if you go back where your mouse was, Stephanie, down where they're digging out the concrete uh, down here at the bottom. So they put in some concrete down here temporarily to kind of provide them with a work platform. All of this is going to go. They're going to dig all of this out and it's going to go down, you know, some number of feet, whether it's, you know, 60, 40 feet, something in there, probably. Um, so they're going to dig down. Um, but then there's the kind of platform here um, above it. This is basically going to be like a top to the, the trench. Um, so none of the, the exhaust or sound waves are kind of deflected down the trench away from the vehicle. So they're gonna be digging underneath that and then up where the excavator is there toward the top of the frame, all of that is going to be excavated out. Um, so what they'll likely do is start at the very top and dig down like a ramp so that they can roll um, you know, vehicles down into this structure. And they'll start excavating, you know, basically from the bottom of this image to the top um, to kind of get it, you know, dug down so that the deepest point is over here. Um, and they'll remove all of that dirt. And then once they get that all graded to, you know, how they want, then they'll probably put down rebar uh, and do concrete on top of that. So we're pretty much just seeing the very, like, top surface level of what this trench is going to be. They're going to be digging all of this out here um, probably the next month. Got some safety bollards installed. Um, thanks, Ryan. And just while we're on the trench, just to show the body, what we're talking about with the trenches can be dug out like this is what we're looking at. And there's the one beam up here and then the big platform here, which we can see the one beam and then the big platform there. There's those embeds in here as well. I didn't notice before. So yeah, stuff. I noticed. Yeah, I noticed the smaller ones uh, overnight, uh, and then uh, we've got the two longer, tri the longer uh, strips of uh, embed there, kind of at the opening. Um, suspected that that may be where a track system of some sort uh, for the platform is going to be. That'll probably cover up the um, the actual hole of the trench for um, for probably we're doing at this point we're thinking maybe it's only there for working uh, up underneath the skirt given the fact that some of the other things we'll touch on here shortly are, are leading away from a, a drive on drive off system with spmts for uh, transportation of the of the boot of the ships and we're saying that because just while we're on the flame trench this has a lot to do with the flame trench because this new stand it's like wow it's very very tall and it looks like it matches up with the embeds on the trench itself. There's four in the corner. We can see the four major embeds in the corners and a couple of extra ones on the ends. We think that's something to do with there's going to be another structure over here, possibly the uh, quick disconnect. So, so these four embeds here, we can see match up with this table here. And this is what... Um, <coughs> Ryan's been rendering here. Excellent. Yep, so this is a pretty rough render I was able to throw together kind of quickly last night. So um, kind of depicting what this will kind of look like. So yeah, the the platform that we thought might've been part of the, the backing of the trench is not actually that anymore. Um, so this seems like it's going to be a platform that'll slide in and out and kind of be stowed in this position during testing, and then they can roll it forward. Uh, and that'll provide them access to work on the engines. And this is actually a design that's um, taken from some of the uh, test stands that they have at Massey's. 
uh, for the Raptors. They they have something very similar to this where they basically roll this platform out, they lift the engines up on top of it, they slide it underneath the test stand, and then they lift the engine up into the, the test cell. Uh, they roll the platform out, they test fire it down on the trench, and they you know rinse repeat that whole process. So um, this is just on a much larger scale, which is, you know, SpaceX doesn't like to reinvent the wheel. They like to take something that, you know, already works and kind of optimize it for something bigger. And uh, that's what they're doing here. This is a much bigger version of uh, stuff that kind of already exists. Oh, you meant at McGregor there, I think. Oh, yep. I might have misspoke. It's all good. So uh, um, awesome work there, Ryan. That looks really, really good. I love your, um, love your textures there. It looks pretty realistic. And we see these pieces here as well. Uh, this piece is already on the part of the bucket we see over in the at Macy's and these pieces have arrived as well. Look like that's where they go. So that's these pieces over here. We saw arriving on a truck there a couple of weeks ago. And this piece here has the has these sections that under here is already attached. Yeah, and we've seen over there those new the newer stringers that we've there's uh, essentially two full pairs sitting there. It appears as though we've got uh, four additional pieces that uh, will make two more of the uh, larger to the larger portions that are, are closer to the wall. And then we're still waiting to see additional pieces, assuming that there's going to be four four more stringers that match the stringers that are already on the uh, lower part of the bucket. I'm going to push forward a bit here. There's more work on the deli on the water deli, so put some plumbing in and some high pressure tanks. It looks like a different type of high pressure tank this time. Instead of those small little tanks, I've found some larger tanks. And that yeah, happened. there's a couple of interesting things on there. I mean, we've been seeing a, a number of manifolds. I was looking at it. We've there actually appears to we talked about four on there. There looks like there's embeds for five of those tanks, but nothing else supports that. But uh, that manifold you're pointing out there, I think, is for the three big tanks, but uh, a little bit above the screen there, there's two additional four-port manifolds. Um, there's those two, and then there's another silver four-port manifold that's over by those tanks. And if you look at those two new tank, the two smaller tanks, it appears as though there's going to be one set, that silver one's going to go at the very end. There's a smaller flange at the very tip that's kind of gray. It's not even painted white. And then there's actually a, a larger port on both ends of the white portion of the tank. So I, I think those three manifolds are actually going to be part of that. The fact that they only have four ports is a little confusing with the five embeds, but uh, we'll have to see what happens there. Yep, and part of the methane farm is this new uh, structure, which we believe is a enclosed flare system instead of a uh, open flare for waste methane they're going to have an enclosed flare system which is interesting yeah it's interesting that they're not uh, trying to reclaim here at uh, at massey's but uh, that might be a compromise to get things functioning quicker um, that they can kind of build the bare minimum for now and maybe use that as an experiment um, Seems a, it's a little bit of a departure from you know, the whole reclaim idea, um, but I'm not sure how effective that reclaim idea, you know, quite is. Maybe there's some issues that SpaceX has ran into, so they're trying to test something different here. But uh, yeah, that was an interesting site to to see pop up. And thanks for the Patreon um, people in Show and Tell. We did a bit of research and found that quite quickly. So more manifold for the deluge system here. Onto the methane farm, there's a few more racks here for some more control work. A little bit more plumbing has been installed. Not a lot changed here. Uh, they've closed the vaults here, and that's just awaiting some more concrete, I guess, before they run the trucks through here. We can see some pipes here staged, ready to put in over here, to and their associated stands. To continue the locks, nitrogen, uh, cryofluids, and the high pressure nitrogen line to continue around into the tank farm. 
Yeah, and last uh, last flyover, we saw the uh, pads there to the right of the uh, of that uh, control um, building. We've got we've got our first of uh, potentially two transformers there in the bottom right corner um, that has shown up as well. Yep, that transformer was just over here in the last flyover. Yep, and we thought that's what they were going to be for. A couple of more paddle stools here. They're a bit of a mystery for now. Not sure what's going to happen in there. Uh, what else we got in here? Ah, oh, this little test area here. We can see these 10 uh, trapezoidal stands have been installed upside down, or we thought they were going the other way around, but anyway, that's the way they are, that way up. And its associated ring here, 20-segment ring, has grown a little bit more. And we still have no real idea, except that it's probably booster-related Yeah, I mean the the kind of the the way that we're seeing those tabs sticking off the end and 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 as well down in the corner where the old can crusher has been, they've been removing a lot of the hydraulic rams off of there, and things are looking very similar in nature. So it it's starting to seem like potentially they may be building an upgraded version uh, of the can crusher. It it is starting to seem. Yeah, I would expect um, if that is indeed the case. <clears throat> We might actually see them fill this ring with concrete because I believe the original can crusher has a concrete floor um, on the inner uh, disc portion of it that all the the pistons were kind of sitting on for the uh, the center engines. So it's possible that we might see them kind of fill that out and then put some concrete in there. Yeah, and I would say that's a, that's absolutely true. Uh, we did uh, some images were taken of the, of the first of those segments to come in, and there was definitely Nelson studs within and on the inside circle, uh, inside surface of that of the of that ring. I had noticed the tabs on the outside here before. Yep. Okay. Now we've no um, our good friend Thomas caught some photos. Should have put it up, sorry, of the crew working on bringing in electrical. So I know there's new electrical cables coming in, which will be a welcome, uh, which will be necessary for all the new testing facilities down here for some more power, which is all underground. So we'll have three phase, they'll have three phase underground power and be able to do away with that with this old overhead single phase or two phase. A bit more concrete here and there. Anything else that Macy's I've missed? Do we maybe want to talk about why the new stand probably isn't um, mobile? For sure. That's a good question. People have been asking that question. So we're looking at having a crane here. Yeah. So I think a lot of us are speculating that um, they would probably have some sort of a mobile stand, which would be like the cryo stands for the ships where they can roll those to the build site. Uh, roll them under a ship and use the bridge crane to to lower it down, transport it here, hook it up, and you know just do the testing and not ever have to lift a ship here um, at the Massey's site. But this test stand, at least right now, does not appear to be very mobile. Um, we think that you can see on the top of the legs there's kind of an opening. Um, we believe that they may actually fill that with concrete uh, once they get the legs welded on. Uh, that would allow the, the legs to be pretty sturdy. It'd be very similar to what they've done to some of the other uh, stands, uh, including the launch mount. Um, but uh, even with doing that, this is quite tall, um, and I'm not sure if this would actually be able to roll down the highway with this ship that high in the air and have a controllable center of gravity. Um, it's certainly possible. We'll have to see if they put any cross bracing between these legs that an SPMT could, you know, drive under and then lift up on, um, you know, similar to a lot of the other stands. Um, that'll kind of be an indication if they do plan to do that. But as of right now, it seems like it would be pretty difficult uh, to transport this down the highway with a ship on top because, you know, it, you start moving that weight a lot higher. And uh, especially if your footprint isn't as wide, and it, it could topple over pretty easily. So um, I think the consensus right now is that they're probably going to have to have a crane here uh, to lift the ships up on top of this stand. It, it will remain permanent. 
And they do that at McGregor as well when they test fire. Falcon 9 is ever crane there just for that as well. Okay. That was a guardrail. Can we see it on this photo? Put on... I think it's sitting. I think they've actually removed it. If you look down on the on the floor on the ground right next to it, it looks like it's sitting there. You can see one end of it right behind that pickup truck, um, and, you, and then to the right of that little building cover, uh, you can kind of see the handrail and the beam uh, where it seems like it's sitting on the ground. Oh, you're down there. Yeah, because you can actually the the there's these tiny little wedge pieces at the, uh, on both long bars up there that we that we were able to see before they even put that one on. You can even see it in Ryan's render. Um, that that it's pretty obvious that that piece has been removed and set to, set aside temporarily. Yeah. Though it's kind of in the shadows, so it's ninety five percent sure that it's there, but it it definitely doesn't look attached to me. Yeah, it looks different than what it did. Uh, previously, there's those little wedges you talk yeah, about. Yeah, there, yeah, there. You can kind of see from the. You can kind of assume, you kind of look at it from how different it looks from last week. Okay, um, and just quickly, this is what they're going to dig the trench out. It's going to look similar to that, and quite deep, with the uh, with the walls left behind, the slurry walls. Yeah, I think that'll be the one curious thing is when they do get that in there, if they'll do any ties through that slurry wall, uh, similar to that image. I mean, right now, there's no evidence to say they will put some horizontal ties in, but uh, time will tell. Would they be put in afterwards, like, and drilled and, um, like, hollowed out a little bit and drilled afterwards, or they're part of a, a, the... Uh... Well, there's no formwork down here, is there? Yeah, I, yeah, I believe that that's usually a, an after thing, but it, I wouldn't quote me on that. Okay, uh, questions for Macy's, please, Jay. I've got a bunch of questions and a little bit of support here. I want to thank Smurf Trooper for gifting a membership, as well as John Malkin with a $50 super chat. Very generous, thank you. Says, thank you for all the great commentary. You make a lot of information easy to digest. Appreciate that. That's why we're here. Tony Z 999 Super Chat, do you think the booster may have, this is a little old, do you think the booster may have run out of fuel or was there fuel sloshing due to loss of control authority on the booster that caused the rud or something else? That sounds like a Ryan question. We didn't yet have successful engine start on descent. Yeah, I'm not quite sure on that yet. Um, I, I want to say it probably has something to do with the... Um, abrupt motion, the spinning and the flailing that the booster was doing, that they may have had um, some oilage collapse, um, you know, decreasing the pressure, and um, it may have led to engines aborting their startup while some were able to to start up. Um, it looked a little reminiscent of the um, S and eight failure, which is kind of why I, I say that. So I think it it's possible that the the motion of the booster was probably what caused the the relight failure. Agreed. A uh, question from Merrick. How far along are they actually getting permission to fire engines at Massey's? Is the EIS complete yet? Uh, I've got no idea about that. Does anyone know about that? I don't, no, I don't sure. know anything specifically about it. I, I believe I've heard some discussions talking that, that, that there would be an EIS required before engine testing would actually commence here. Um, but there, I don't think there's been any public documentation to uh, say that that process is um, vi visible to the outside public. Right. And on a related note, Count Your Money asks, how does Mexico feel about the flame trench pointed at them? <laughs> I'm sure they'll be okay once they get the clearances through. I'm sure that'll be taking into consideration there's not a lot on that side of mexico right there a couple of little farmers here and there yeah i know it was a pretty big shock when a lot of the foundation work started occurring on i guess this far side um indicating that it would be blowing toward mexico i i was pretty much for sure that it would be blowing towards the the site to um you know appease any you know potential issues uh that would come from you know blowing into mexico so I'm sure that there's been discussions that have been had. Uh, they're just not kind of public. 
Um, so we can't really speculate too much about that, but um, I'm I'm sure that it's not going to be a, a shock when they fire up the first ship and you know there's a, a steam cloud that's kind of blown over the river. Right. And related, uh, Rocket Prophet asks, well, will the flame directional slide have water running through it? It looks to be made of tubes. Yep, that is, uh, it's very similar to designs that are used at other, um, I guess, engine testing facilities. I mean, they do this with RS-25 engines. They've, you know, Relativity has a, uh, a deflector that they've documented, you know, online before showing all these tubes. This is the same design that they use at Massey's for the Raptor test stands. Um, they have all of these little tube structures that they, they run water through. So the water cools the tubes as well as uh, they've got holes poked in it, just like the, uh, the water-cooled flame deflector underneath the launch mount. Um, and uh, it, it sprays water out, cools down the, the exhaust, uh, helps turn it to steam. So it's, it's really the exact same idea that's underneath the launch mount. It's just in a different shape. Um, so this is kind of funneling all of that in, a, in one direction. All right, a question from William Foss. Is this stand taller than the ones currently at suborbital pad B? I believe um, where the stand, so like if it's sitting on the floor, like if you discount, you know, the, the actual trench part, I believe this stand is technically a little bit shorter. Um, I haven't actually measured it. I could, I could do that here quick and maybe give an answer. Um, but uh, I think it's a little bit shorter than the, the suborbital stands, but the overall distance that the flame is going to travel before it hits on something is going to be much further than uh, the suborbital stands. And this should allow some uh, more throttling up, is that correct? And, and perhaps longer duration burning as well. Okay, yeah, we so I just measured. Mean... Yeah, go ahead, right. Ryan. So I just measured on uh, my model here, and it's about eight meters from the bottom of the ship to the top of the concrete there. So I believe that's roughly what the suborbital stands are. Um, so this is basically double the distance that the the suborbital stand would have. I believe the contact with the um, the flame trench would be about. Oh, let me measure it here quick. Yeah, that like seems about, about 20 meters. Right. Yeah, because I know the way we could see in previous flyovers, some of the those temporary uh, pipe stands that the the ring is currently sitting on were about the same size as a six meter uh, segment of the of the LR sixteen hundred, and then take the the uh, pipe stands that it said that the uh, the uh, final stands or legs are sitting on. So, yeah, I think that those numbers are right on spot. A very related question from Detroit Mission Control. If SpaceX will need a crane for the new test fire, test fire stand, do you think they might build a mini Mechzilla next to the flame trench? I've heard that somewhere through chat, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I mean, that's a thought. Um, I, I think uh, we see the, they've gotten much better with the two-point lifters, but we can see that they're still pretty challenging when you're out in the elements and in the wind. Um, to get them to interface with the, the socket on the ship without damaging tiles. And I imagine that's a point that SpaceX would like to optimize. Um, so it's certainly possible that they could build a structure that would be much better at lifting the ships here. Um, I'm not going to rule that out because I think it's a very good idea, um, but I don't think it's something that they'll have initially. And um, so orientation-wise, we believe the tiles will be towards the front of Macy's and the QD back there. So and this, the Q, the uh, Megzilla would have to grab it from the far side, correct? Depending on how they did it or how they would do it, I don't think it would necessarily be like the launch tower, but there would be some sort of a, a structure that could clamp onto the ship that would be stabilized with the ground because that's the biggest issue with the two point lifters is that they're hanging from a crane that can sway in the wind so it needs to be some sort of a sturdy structure that attaches to the ground i mean it, it could be something um like a giant you know upside down u shape uh that would be you know as tall as the ship um that could actually you know you could drive the ship up next to it it could pick it up and translate it over with like a bridge crane okay cool 
That's about all I got for Massey's related, uh, but uh, related to the booster 10 failure again, uh, John Depker, $5 super chat. Could the booster spin be from a grid fin getting stuck? The out of control part of the, the booster. It, it, it didn't quite look like that. Um, comparing it to like some of the other failures, I, it doesn't really look like a grid fin gets stuck necessarily. It, it really kind of looks like, um, I, ma I made this comparison before, but uh, if you're familiar with like a PID controller, um, it kind of looks like a, a controller that wasn't calibrated correctly because there was like some overshoot and undershoot um, with the way that the grid fins were, were working. And that's it's a really simple comparison. It, it's not exactly how it works, but um, it kind of looks like there was some unexpected um, you know, behavior that the, the controller could not account for. So. And I want to thank Daniel Hogbin for joining. Thanks for becoming a member, Daniel. Thank you, Ryan, for your input today. Awesome. Uh, we'll continue on. This is a development site uh, where the shops and the restaurant are going. It's moving along. It looks like they've added a heap of uh, soil or rock to the top. I think they put the gravel down underneath this. There's gravel underneath, and this looks like topsoil on top to put the concrete onto. And with that, we're going to move on to Macy, uh, to San, uh, Sanchez. Okay, Sanchez. <clears throat> Let's start over at the rings where they're constructing rings. So they're continuing to work on the transport stand. We're expecting to see the stabilize, stabilization, stabilizer pins which we haven't seen yet on this second transport stand. They don't seem to be in much hurry to get these completed. They seem to be doing fine with just one transport stand for now. But as things uh, get uh, more advanced, we should need some more transport stands. Yeah, and I think at a certain point too, it's going to be not even, uh, it'll be a little bit of transport stand and maybe even a little bit of storage stand as well at some point, given the fact that all of our workstations inside Mega Bay 1 are occupied right now. If we if we continue to see a, a buildup of boosters um, and they need some space, they, we may start seeing that some outside storage. And that I think that would be even more to the point where they were going to need some additional ones. So these uh, spiderweb type uh, structures, we saw one already going to the star factory. Here's another one almost complete and another one started. And they're interesting where they've got a big cutout then four other sort of cutouts. Looks like access or something and another hole here. Yeah, I think what we were discussing most recently is that potentially that the cutout there, the the bigger rectangular one, may be for uh, access. Uh, that this would be a platform used inside of the payload bay section of a ship or some other section where the downcomer um, to the header tanks would, uh, follows the wall and the one cutout, and that those other four slight notches may be some other um, structural element within the sh inside of the rings that we don't often see. So a jig, not a permanent part of the ship, obviously. Yeah, I put more thought yeah. into that as well um, last night that it's possible they could have multiple of these platforms kind of stacked on top of each other and they would lift the payload section up above it, center it, and then lower it down. And then they could have access with multiple platforms to different areas within the structure. So those four kind of um, smooth cutouts that you see kind of placed evenly, those could be actually be for the supports that you know that might go between um and actually hold up different you know, multiple platforms of this within inside a payload bay um so it's clearly a work platform of some kind but uh yeah it's a it's a little bit of a mystery yeah the more i actually that kind of pops into my mind it almost bears this structure almost bears a little bit of resemblance to that uh the false floor that they put into the hls nose cone um, if anyone remembers what that looked like, it felt like it was a similar flooring structure. Okay, we'll move on to the 
tower sections here, we can see section nine has had significant work since the last flyover with all the four posts stood up and the uh, all the steel work added. Yeah, there's the most of the work this week has been concentrated on that lower on that the lower platform level, and then uh, and then that there's that mid level at where the shiv beam is, um, and then essentially some of those bottom structures will get replicated after they put the the mini post on top that uh, finishes out the fourth corner of the main structure, which will be right here, isn't it? Yeah, right in that, uh, right between the, you got essentially the sheeting on the two sides that yeah, right there in the middle is kind of open for where that little po the little post will go. Very good. And we've noticed squares all marked everywhere as well on the concrete. Which could be just for staging. Uh, I mean, there's the tower, we know there's the tower sections in here and some more to our sections here. So there's seven all up, one, two, three, four, five. There's two more somewhere. Yeah, the two the two in the middle on the left there where the stairs are below the flatbed truck. And uh, right, right on the end of the uh, inventory tent. You've got the three up top, you got two to the bottom left, and then the two where they're building. That's correct, thank you. There they are there, yep. Yeah, the the stair uh, inventory has kind of dwindled a little bit there, uh, where the two tower, those two uh, tower section uh, areas are as well. And we've we've seen some of the construction of uh, outfitting of stairs and landings on the on the segments at the port. And I think uh, we've even there's some in. I don't remember if segment eight has also gotten some as well. I believe I saw some in, in there as well. Let me just quickly jump over to the port here. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of change out there other than uh, just a continuation. Uh, I did see over there that uh, segment seven also has gained some stairs since last week. Oh, hey, and that was last week, sorry. Ago. <laughs> yeah. That was for comparison, trust me. Comparison, yes. But it looks like segment one over there that they put across the street, apparently that one's not going to get any stairs uh, installed in advance, it seems. Um, but all the rest of these ones over here, at least three out of the four that are on the port side of the road, um, have been further outfitted. It makes you wonder why they uh, went to all the effort of creating those spots in Sanchez if they're going to do a bunch of work here. But I suppose maybe the you know everything showed up here, so they thought might as well just do some initial construction here, and who knows, maybe we'll see them moved over to Sanchez with continued work. I don't imagine that they'll allow them to do everything here at the port, but okay. I have in this section we found the second grid pin over here. And we found the first grid fin too. <coughs> I actually found it last week after the show. Uh, so there's the first grid fin they took off. And then they've taken a second grid fin up, boost to four. Someone's going to get a really nice coffee table or some kind of, um, <coughs> some kind of art. Yeah, the pace of which that they've started taking a few things off of there is a little bit interesting to see if they're going to pick up some pace uh, in in an effort to scrap it soon, or if or if they're just getting them down there for whatever reason. It, it, the lack of urgency uh, is confusing. Yeah, I imagine they okay. probably want to open up some space to to store boosters because they're probably going to get a little bit full uh, once fourteen is ready to go on a work platform. Um, 11 might be at the launch site, um, but uh, at some point they're probably going to start needing some places to, to store these outside, otherwise they'll be halting construction. Absolutely. So the scrapyard doesn't seem to be a scrapyard, but seem to have some flight articles here. Uh, pretty sure that's a flight article and the hot ring here should be a flight article. And perhaps those three uh, to do with some testing. They seem to be here for a while. There's no scrapping going on, even though it's called a scrapyard. 
Yeah, with the scrapyard just moving around wherever they have a, a available space. Uh, right now, they've just needed additional space to store things. Uh, as they as we will get into it uh, when we get over there, but it seems as though they just needed room to get all the B14 uh, components out of the building and uh, just using whatever space they can find. I'm gonna touch on the uh, burn panels before we, I guess, leave that area too much. So here you can see, uh, this is where they typically prep the, the burn panels for the, the launch mount. And uh, there's a couple of various shapes here uh, indicating that they are probably going to add a, a second layer to uh, the areas on the launch mount that they did not add a second layer to um, after flight two. They put a panel on either side of the booster QD after uh, flight two, but uh, looks like they may extend that a uh, couple sections in each direction uh, further. So I believe they did the same prep here um, after flight two. So um, we'll probably see them do that. So you can actually see there's a little bit of a shadow right um, to the kind of a diagonal. Yeah, right there. That's the lip of one of the burn panels that they added before flight three. Um, so there's a probably a panel or two. Uh, it looks like there's three panels. There's one that's like a, a uniform and then there's two that are a little bit of a different shape. So um, we might see uh, a little bit of a different pattern with those. Yeah, it's that, that corner isn't exactly symmetrical in there, so um, indicates a little bit of a different shape. So I think we'll probably see um, a little bit of a, yeah, a couple of those plates. That, surprise, there's not a fourth one, um, but we did notice these other plates too. There's a kind of a bunch of weird shapes, so I have to keep an eye on those. I'm not, I'm not really sure what those are for yet. Yeah, and there's been a lot of burn plate. There's a, over by the production tent, actually, there's uh, uh, the inventory tent, sorry. There's been actually a number. There's a stack that's in the corner. Um, it's been there probably for a good many a weeks. Um, and actually, it looks like it might have been moved. It's in the back left corner there next to the, uh, I forget what that section of where that's blocked. Oh, yeah, there they are in the corner by the uh container wall just to the left oh, in the I see corner. You, there's, you can see a whole bunch of, and a bunch of them are small little wedge pieces. Um, yeah, further to the left. left right on the left edge of the image there, Stephanie, is where you want to highlight it out. Yep, right up there. You can see the holes in them. Yeah, but some of those are trapezoidal. A bunch of them are trapezoidal, kind of like some of the initial ones we saw, I think. Yeah, those actually look like... Uh... Yeah, that trapezoid, that kind of screams uh, water-cooled steel plate, to be honest, because that's the same shape that that stuff initially was. But with yeah. that, uh, lots of holes? Yeah, that's how they were able to get inside and weld those vertical parts. Um, it'd be nice to get some ground images of that, because I wonder if that has some... There's a shadowing on the side that almost looks like it has some thickness to it. And there's a number of other plates here, isn't there? That's not just one, there's one plate down there. And there's some more stacked on top. That are a weird shape. Let's see if I get another photo of that. But yeah, looking back a couple of weeks and even going back quite a ways, there's been a number of those different plates have been floating around kind of in that vicinity and restacked, shuffled as the different spaces have been needed. Yeah, the only shape that would require that is a water-cooled steel plate. So I wonder if we're seeing some of those parts show up for launch mount B. Okay, let's continue here. Okay, we see some more work on this commodities farm. I guess it's for the whole star factory. Probably some argon for the whole of star factory and perhaps some other gases here as well. And to round out Sanchez, let's try and find the car park. There it is. <clears throat> we'll look at the car park here. Sorry, the parking lot. That's me, Aussie there, same car park. 
Yeah, we're definitely getting a good view of what kind of what the shape, overall shape and, and uh, structure is going to be now that they've started to expose all those piles to start putting some pile caps in and uh, get ready for what is probably going to be a, a precast um, assembly structure. And we can see, we can see that it's going to possibly end through here, leaving this car park still at ground level, maybe for VIPs and executives. And access to this building as well. Looking in here, we have some more concrete work in this area. So there was speculation this area maybe end up being a high bay. I mean, just because they pour concrete doesn't rule anything out because concrete's kind of temporary around here. But for now, possibly a scrapyard. It was here at one stage, a scrapyard. The mobile scrapyard that seems to move all over the place. Um, and we've got this access road is for that uh, building and the, the oven over here that can come around through here. So at the moment, there's no access. Actually, we'll come to that on the build site. Uh, any questions for uh, Sanchez, please, Joe? Uh, I've got a question from Crane Man. Could those be burn plates for the bottom of oil and legs? Um, I don't think it matches up with those shapes. I mean, I'm assuming he's talking about the pile of uh, triangular ones in the yeah, inventory that's about, area. That's about when it came in. Yep. I those don't match a shape that I'm familiar with. Um. I and I feel like, yeah, those I are also scraps. Feel, yeah, that could be. Yeah, I feel like the, the oil M legs have, after what we've seen after this flight is that the the paint coating and, and everything else seem to have held up really well. That I'm not sure that there's any need for additional burn plates at the base of the legs or anywhere on the legs. Uh, so I missed a little thing here. They're putting this wall here. Sorry, Joe, to interrupt you. This wall is continuing around the outside of the whole site and it continues through over to this new section it continues along all the way around and i guess it will eventually join up with this wall here as well so please continue with questions joe i only have one more unrelated from perpetual nerd uh, is the land swap official now sorry if this has already been answered no, the land swap. Still... Actually, yeah, yeah they, they're in a pub. We're in a public uh, comment period until the end of March, um, and then there's uh, some additional things that'll have to ha happen with that. Or no, that's a, no, that man, that's on the strip of land with the Texas. But the swap, I think, is still in process. You can correct me, Ryan, since you're <laughs> about to say it. I, I think it's still in process too, and maybe a slight reminder is don't comment on that because it takes extra time for them to go through and uh, sift through the comments. So even if you know you are pro SpaceX and you want them to get the land, don't comment, please, because it's just extra because they do have to respond to, to everybody. Uh, they've cleared those couple of articles from behind the high bay there. Okay, let's go on to the build site. Yeah, I, I, while we're actually on this image here real quick, uh, one thing to note, and we could saw two of them in the other one, we, we've seen uh, some additional aft flaps uh, show up recently. There's one over there outside the inventory tent. Um, and then we say when we were looking at the wall um, by tent four, there's two additional ones that were over there. We had one um, on-site uh, previous flyovers and two more have uh, been delivered recently or at least come out of a building where they might have been. Nice. So ship thirty two needs its uh, flap still. Do those come in with the tiles already on them, or do they come over here to the bakery and do they put tiles on? I don't uh, recall. <laughs> Might be more of a, a Jax question. How do we go, Jax? 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 Okay, on to the build site, and we've mostly from this side of the build site. So we'll start with the Star Factory. Uh, hang on, let's go back a second and start with the ring yard. So we are saying before about there's uh, no access at the moment really to get 
sections out of the factory here over to the front of the base. So we saw a few sections staged, which two of which have gone inside and uh, for booster 14. Yeah, we've seen the uh, the booster 14's forward do uh, forward section was behind the high bay there for a little while, um, and as well, and then uh, the forward section two um, that was to the right of the doorway have uh, gone inside to stack on the right turntable, um, and then uh, alongside with the liquid oxygen tank is over on the left turntable uh, being mated to the uh, aft section. So. Only got two more two more sections of uh, booster fourteen to make the two separate tanks, and then they'll be ready to make it one. One of those sections is over here. Is that correct? That's the other section. This section and that one is that the two sections that are left. Yeah, it's believed that the the three ring there to the left of the doorway is the next section to stack, and then that four ring section up by the nose cone is the uh, F four section that would finish off um, the methane tank um, before uh, being put onto the LOX tank. Okay, well, we're in this area, we'd normally go to the uh, Mega Bay 2. And we can see they've started this a beam up here, which is believed to be this same beam up the top above the doorway. And the bottom beam on the door, the bit that goes actually up and down, we can see has been staged outside the bay. So that looks like that's happening soon. And the actual door is still over yonder we can see so it, it looks like spacex likes these doors i assume that mega bay one was kind of the trial and uh looks like it's working out pretty well so getting that uh door ready for mega bay two and not much news on the high bay we know it's ship 29 over here is on the left on the turntable leaving ship 30 and 31 in the bay, in the high bay. And ship 32, of course, is over there in the rocket garden awaiting its fate. And still ship 26, whatever, still there. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, let's go on to the actual star factory. We can see... We can see it's putting... Uh, post to go up against the old part of the old part of the factory, the original part of the Star Factory. It seems old nowadays, doesn't it? We can see some double footings here, suggesting some kind of doorway here. Yeah, and I think there's actually there may be even well, there's some pipes hanging out at that next bay. That next one I was suspecting potentially to be a doorway, the way that some of the the footings were spread out. Um, but it does look like there's they're just. Uh, working on footings yet because there's some uh looks like a couple of conduits sticking out to the left um of the double and the, on the edge of the building i was thinking maybe two doors side by side but that doesn't seem to be right anymore either so most of the footings once these footings go in most of the footings are complete now once these ones are put in by the look of it i'll go over this shot uh here Yeah, and we're kind of seeing on a couple of those footings that there's maybe a potential that they're going to expand the the phase one section of Star Factory uh, a little bit closer to the bays. Those first two that have the uh, rectangle forms for the slab on them, uh, kind of the fact that they're allowing for a concrete slab on all four sides, the way that it's formed out makes me think that uh, they're going to they may potentially extend the phase one, uh, but we haven't yet seen them start digging any footings in that direction yet. Okay, and while we're on this photo, as Stumpy would say, uh, we can see they've got the last, this diagonal section starting to put uh, columns on. And these are unusual columns in that they're undercut here. We saw these on the ground and we're, we assume this is where they were going, and which is an unusual kind of post. Yeah, it seems like they've. From what we can see, there's there's uh, Ziegert uh, tabs uh, on the lower section that's inset, as well as on the upper portion. We are seeing uh, in this picture the beginning. The, there's some uh, glass uh, mounting uh, beams on there as well. So it, it's definitely an interesting uh, kind of mounting that they that are not carrying it all the way to the ground as a, a thicker wall, and they're 
going to have a little inset there at the ground level. I suggest that it may be a, a human, not just one wild speculation, it might be a human door. Sometimes you see it with an overhang like that. Uh, the, all of the um, embeds here are single bolt, so there's not a double row of bolts here. So it looks like all these posts are going to be similar to this. I've been kind of expecting some sort of like a little lobby section. So I don't know, maybe they'll put something in here that is somewhat of a lobby, but they also have that large building going up on the opposite side. Um, so who knows, it, that whole kind of lobby section idea might be uh, a little defunct at this point. And this little yeah. bit of wall here, so has that single rail belt as well. It looks kind of similar, but kind of different. And then it's not a continuous slab. Uh, splitting, sorry. Yeah, and you can see on the the cutout there, we, we're suspecting that there's a doorway there in the back of there. So it seems like this little wedge shape, at least the first couple segments of it, not including all the way by the highway, may potentially be a lane at which uh, finished articles will, may either sit uh, awaiting exit of the building or just be a, a corridor for, for the exit. Um, it seems to be very tall um, based off of the beam that they've crossed over to the high to the previous sections constructed um, to allow any that we were we're thinking maybe that payload bays with a with a nose cone may be pre-assembled inside and have less external welding um, processes in the in the bays as they're constructed. Okay, we should be right on time, Emily. So um, the parapet wall has some some steel uh, fascia on it, and we're expecting this to stay. We've discussed in show and tell. Can you explain that, BJ? How this is going to stay at the same height? Yeah, we think that that for some from for some perspective down on the, between the bays or whatnot, that it looks like this parapet wall is going to just continue in that line all the way into and then go above that doorway to essentially make it so that the um the front and the side essentially all three sides kind of here of the of the taller section will appear one size we won't see the sloping um of the nose cone hall or that intermediate hall you can kind of see where the parapet wall is going to extend off of those the angled wall as we're kind of calling it um so it's a, just trying to keep a straight line keep it nice and streamlined um and it seems like there must be some vantage point from back by the bays on the ground that they're trying to keep a, a nice straight line that they've continued it in the building, but not all the way through the building. And this uh, post is the tallest post in all the Star Factory, I think we find we found out. Oh, yeah, I would suspect I would suspect that every one of those posts will be identical, and that they, when it reaches the highway side, that that parapet will will be right at the roof level uh, of the of the most of the highway side uh, walls. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Um, anything more on the new staff factory we haven't mentioned? I mean, they have started going into that next uh, that next row uh, of it. They still kind of half where tent three was now. So we've got, once that one's done, there's about, there's two more um, spans that'll get us back to the main star factory. It's or the original, on. I should say, not main. It's all the main. It's coming on quite quickly. So I finished this side on the left-hand side pretty well. Just a bit of more roofing to go. And it's got a really nice little curve in it there, which matches the road nicely. And it seems, yeah, it won't be too long. We'll have all the steel completely up and we'll have answers, finally have answers over around this area very soon. Okay, so there's some slight speculation this may be a roadway through here. Not sure about that yet. Once they pull tent four down, they could have some access around this way. I was saying before, there's no actual access at the moment for sections to come out of the star factory except for right around the back all the way around the road around that way which is possible but for now we've got all the boosters and ships for the next uh, four four flights is that right five flights yeah no, four flight and four flights were the vehicles yeah four flights yep yeah. okay we'll move on to the new office area 
And our dog bones are slowly getting covered up here and there. We have a couple of new dog bones. And an interesting shape is happening, is starting to happen here with the outside footings. It seems to be going to, like it's going to cut in. Well, it may not. It may, cause those lines were showing the outline of the building. Although here they're not, are they? So perhaps that will come through here. <clears throat> yeah, it seems when they they installed the dewatering lines that they kept it uh, well outside of the actual footprint of the building. Um, it definitely is a, a, a slight change from what, what many of us were thinking, that the building would be a little bit more symmetrical. But it seems to be... Uh, that they've decided this left wing to be a little bit different. Yeah, they may do a uh, small parking lot there to the left side of the building, kind of coming off the, the road there. So they, they might do something like that. And this is, so it's a curtain wall. So this will be over, like, this might be a, a structural wall on the outside. The weight of the building, as far as I understand, is going to sit on those dog bones. And it'll have a light sort of duty wall onto this foundation beam which is a beam in between the two footings you can see here it bridges footings so even if the soil should subside underneath here it's actually beam right across it'll stay rigid yeah and that curtain wall is actually in line with the uh, embeds in the outer portion of those dog bones even through here yep yeah. Is that what you mean? Well, at the top there, I would imagine that that next sign that will be there. But if we, when you look at the dog bone, too, you've got the you've got the middle of the dog bone, and but the uh, embed that is in the the end of it is actually right in the middle of the curtain wall, right there. I get you. There's that's the big square, the little yeah over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I think that's an elevator shaft. I'm not sure about this one. It looks like a vault. It looks like it's going to be poured with walls as an internal and external uh, boxing, I call it. You call it formwork. <clears throat> and they're quite deep in the ground, some of these, once again. So it's interesting to see that take shape. I think I mentioned earlier quickly that the concrete wall along the back here is continuing along. They've finished up to this section. And I'm guessing somehow they're going to come around this section where they come straight through or actually around the road. We're not sure yet. Lots of nice new concrete. I buried all the downpipe plumbing and all the drainage plumbing. And I can't see. Oh, there it is. That's the stormwater drain at this stage over here. And they're still waiting for environmental protection paperwork to actually dump water into this waterway out here. And that's that, that's probably the reason why the dam pipes are not hooked up yet. Still, it doesn't show in this photo well, but the dam pipes still aren't hooked up. So we're probably waiting for paperwork to dump water into that bay. We have a ring yard. It even has circles. Ring yard two point zero or three point zero now. Yeah, I don't think I even noticed it in the last flyover. It was already there, but we got a little nose cone tip sitting over there as well. But that's not new. Uh, farther up in the corner by the pipes. Okay. Are these parts of a header tank? Are they domes? Are they? What are they? Yeah, they're domes. I just I don't recognize what they uh, are part of. A little nose cone. Hopefully version 2 nose cone. Okay, we've got 15 minutes. All right, we're going really well. Let's go over to the village. We have been noticing that SpaceX seems to be acquiring some of the vacant plots, uh, like vacant blocks. Uh, in particular, this one, I think, and this one, and now they're filling in and constructing more houses on. So it might not be too long before they own all these blocks of land yet. Yeah, it could uh, well, just be a, a continuation of the process of going lot to lot. Um, 
in the construction process since they've got so many buildings that they've been kind of doing in stages of crews moving plot to plot. They're going quite well with the construction of houses in here. That's quite quick coming from the building industry. That's pretty good progress, what they're doing there. Interesting, the road at the bottom of the frame, how it kind of like seems to come off the the end there. Uh, I'm not sure if they're kind of in, anticipating on, I guess, having it dig out into the, uh, the sand there. Yeah, I mean they've Maybe been putting that retain that retaining wall is probably gonna is probably gonna be the very end of that road. It does seem like it's gonna taper to a nice wedge for whoever lives in that last <laughs> house or two. Certainly, yeah. Uh, digging north foundations for the wall through here and through here as well. We saw that last week. We didn't see this one last week on the last flyover, sorry. <laughs> okay, well we're in this area. We've got lots of rebar in this section. Looks like it's going to be completely covered in concrete. Concrete. And they've boxed out this building. And lots of concrete. And this little block here as well. There's some thing about this block was they didn't win it in an auction somewhere. Oh. I can't remember the story behind that. Do you remember that one day? Uh, but BJ? The, I do not uh, remember that one, but they've um, definitely making some good progress on pouring some more concrete, getting in the quotas. Spreading more dirt. Okay, is there anything in the building site we haven't covered? Yeah, I mean, just to touch on it there, the uh, I mean, we in that last photo, the the two point, the second two point lifter and the booster transport stand are kind of sitting in the formerly known crane yard, which uh, seems to have been relocated, and this is more of a general purpose storage. Yep. Okay, Joe, we've got some questions for the build site, please. Indeed, but I would like to thank me, Mr. Jono, for becoming a member, as well as DMARS, gifting 10 memberships. Thank you very much. That's incredible support. Uh, Leroy Hibbs with a super sticker for 20 pounds saying woot. Um, then we'll dive into questions. Uh, Hoopball asks, why is Sanchez considered different from the build site if they're both connected? Um, that's just the way we've always done it. It seems to split into nice sections for the shows. And they're uh, very different, very, very different areas. Uh, the staff factory is very much a factory area and the village. And Sanchez is very much its own little area with its own little life. I think that should answer that question. Yeah, and if sure I remember not. correctly, yeah, and if I remember the history of why we call it, it's called Sanchez has to do with the the uh, oil wells or the gas wells, I believe that were in there initially. It has some the name itself has something to do with the history of that site. That is absolutely correct as well. Crane Man asks, will Mega Bay Two also receive ventilation above the door? We haven't seen it yet, but they're obviously going to need some kind of ventilation because there obviously would be some kind of air movement. We have bottom vents so far, which we don't see on Mega Bay 1. So it's going to be slightly different. Uh, maybe we thought maybe there'd be vents in the top of the elevator sections, but that doesn't seem to be a thing either yet. So, yeah, possibly. You know, but if, if there are, it begs the question, why wait till later? To put them in, I guess. All right. Since you wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, booster hardware, um, what is different about booster 14 forward? Is there more than normal vents? Booster 13 has seven locks vents. What's new or different about booster 14 ring section that's new and next generation? I got an idea on this one, Ryan. I actually have not been following um, the the booster sections as closely recently, um, so I don't really know the answer to that. I I know there are some changes that they've made um, on the vehicles, uh, specifically like some of the vehicles that were made um, after like Flight One, or they they started sections after Flight One. Um, they kind of already had like their FTS boxes in one spot, and they've since moved them. Um, away from the common dome, so they've they've gone back and they've adjusted that on on some of the vehicles. I, I believe the newer vehicles there, they've moved the the FTS box up 
um, actually on the methane tank. Um, so they've kind of shifted the location so they don't have to put on the like adapter containers, I guess you could say, that they, they did on like ship 25 and 28. I'm not sure, I think 29 might have the same um, kind of additional hardware on it to, to move the FTS box, but I know future vehicles, they've, they've moved stuff like that. As far as the vent count goes, I know they've been changing that quite a bit. Um, and I haven't paid enough attention on the, the boosters to, to tell, I guess, what exactly they've done on, on booster 14. Right on. Thanks for the elaboration. And thanks, Sharpie, for a $10 super chat. Well done. Well done job, our GV team. Thanks, Sharpie. We appreciate you. Thanks, Sharpie. Okay, any more questions? I'm clear. Okay, well, that will conclude our live stream for the day. We're like five minutes early. Um, Ryan or BJ, any more comments to end the show out? I think we've covered everything. I, th I think uh, all the key things that have uh, taken place in the last week uh, have been gone over and looking forward to what we see in the next week. Okay, well, we'll um, sign off, uh, BJ, please. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for another episode. Uh, exciting launch last week, and uh, I think uh, we're all excited to see the next one come soon. And uh, with that, uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, BJ, for your comments today. And Ryan? Yeah, thanks for having me, and thanks for everybody for tuning in. Uh, it's always exciting when we have these uh, post-launch reviews because get to see uh, any potential damage or any optimizations that they've they've made. So I think overall, uh, things are looking pretty good, and hopefully SpaceX can uh, get back to, to testing and we can get uh, Flight 4 to happen here in probably about two months. Um, sure looking uh, like uh, these faster flight cadences are going to become a norm, and hopefully they keep uh, decreasing the, the time between flights. It'll be really exciting. Thank you so much for your comments today, Ryan, especially with the flight review. That was an awesome flight review. Thank you very much. And I'll sign up myself. I'm Stephanie B, coming to you from Australia. And thank you, RGB, for the wonderful photos. And I'll let Joe sign off. Thank you, Joe. All right. You're welcome. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, BJ, for your time today, your expertise, and sharing with everybody. Thanks, RGB team, for getting these awesome photos. Thanks, Emlyn, for turning the knobs and pushing the buttons. And thanks to my wife, Astro Jen, for scheduling you guys. With that, most engines cut off, hot staging confirmed, love ya, bye.